Hello, and uh, welcome to today's Astronomy Colloquium. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you today's speaker, Jorge Moreno, who is a professor of physics and astronomy at Pomona College, a visiting scholar at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for um, Astrophysics, and a recent faculty fellow at Downing College in Cambridge. Jorge received their bachelor's and master's degree from Sinvestad in Mexico City before earning their PhD at the University of Pennsylvania. And since then, Jorge has been doing science all over the world, including as a postdoctoral fellow at ESAS in Italy and a CETA Prize Fellow at the University of Victoria in Canada. Prior to their appointment in Pomona College, Jorge was also a visiting professor at Haverford College Bryn Mawr College and an assistant professor at Cal Poly Pomona. In addition to their scientific contributions to the field of theoretical astrophysics, which we will hear about shortly, Jorge is dedicated to making astronomy a more equitable field and has been recognized for their efforts with multiple awards, including the SACNIS Outstanding Research and Professional Mentor Award, as well as the Claremont College's Diversity Teaching Award. So I know I speak on behalf of all of us to say we are very excited to have you and we're excited to hear about galaxies lacking dark matter. So, thank, thank you for having me. And it's a pleasure to be here and it's so nice to see a couple of Pomona alums, Dylan and Cameron. It's, Pomona College is a really special place. I've been an assistant professor there for six years and maybe in a couple of weeks I'll get a phone call from the dean saying that I'm promoted to associate professor with tenure. So we'll, I'll celebrate early today. but. I'm looking forward to celebrating very soon. So as Irina said, I'm a computational astrophysicist. I use supercomputers to simulate galaxies. And my philosophy when it comes to studying the universe is I like to think of galaxies as complex beings like people. So if you meet me, if you talk to me, if you pay attention to my mannerisms, to my accent, to the food I like to eat, you can infer something about my history, the kind of family I grew up with in the city I grew up with, my culture, things like that. So by looking at the properties, the structures, the metallicities, the kinematics of galaxies, I use that information to infer the merger history of those systems and their interaction history. Here I'm showing you a video from, this was created by Andrew Wetzel, who was a postdoc here a few years ago, using the FIRE simulation. FIRE stands for Feedback in Realistic Environments. You all know Phil Hopkins, he's one of the leads of this project. And what I'm showing you here is a simulation of the creation of the Milky Way galaxy but the Milky Way is not alone in the universe. It has neighbors, it has satellites. We see in this case that there is a, the Milky Way, a tiny dwarf galaxy comes in and it gets completely disrupted. So because this tiny galaxy is in the presence of a more massive system, it's strongly affected by it. So I want you to keep that picture in mind because today I will talk about galaxies without dark matter and it turns out that these strong interactions might have something to do with creating such galaxies. But before doing that, I want to acknowledge that I conduct all my work in Tonga, Gabrielino land. Before this was the United States, this was Mexico, and before this was Mexico, this was actually indigenous land. My roots are in the border of Mexico and the U.S., so my roots are Apache and Kikapu from my father's side, and Tlaxcalteco from my mother's side. So I carry indigenous blood, and it's really important for me to acknowledge that. Also, I'd like to thank my co-authors. This was published in Nature Astronomy a few months ago. And I'm really excited because some of those co-authors are here at Caltech. And some of them were at Caltech before they were postdocs here. And I also really want to highlight the second author of this paper. So this is Shani Danieli. So this is a paper that's full of theorists. The second author, we basically split the work. This, we came up with this idea. And she really held me accountable. It, I think it's really important if you are a theorist to work with observers because they really hold you accountable to be to do really excellent work. So I don't know if Caltech will be hiring in the next few years, or if you are, you should definitely try to scoop her. She's, I would say she's the best observer in her generation, and I think any institution will be lucky to have her. So, and also this paper has gotten a lot of attention in the media. It's really exciting when that happens, because you have no idea what they're saying in so many languages. And also sometimes you get weird, angry emails from people who don't really do astronomy, but that's part of it, but it's, otherwise it's fun. So my talk is organized as follows. First, I'll give you a little bit of background of dark matter and galaxies, especially in the low mass region, in the dwarf region. 
Then I'll talk about these weird objects, these galaxies without dark matter. Then I'll talk about Firebox, which is a cosmological simulation with the fire model, which in my opinion is the best simulation out there. Then I'll talk about challenges by other simulations. So many groups around the world were trying to simulate these galaxies without dark matter and they couldn't succeed. And I'll talk a little bit about why I think that's the case. And then I'll talk about physical mechanisms. What is the physics behind creating galaxies without dark matter? Now, after each section, I'll give you a mini review because I'm the kind of person who, if I'm paying attention for 15 minutes, I just get lost. So I don't want that to happen to you. So I, after each section, I'll give a mini review and now I'll invite you to ask questions. But you're welcome to ask questions at any point. So a little bit of background. So for people who don't work with galaxies, we know that galaxies dark, have dark matter because of their rotation curves. If we measure how quickly things are moving around the galaxy, we can infer the dynamical mass as a function of distance from the axis of rotation. And this is how Vera Rubin back in the day found that if you only had variance, you wouldn't be able to explain the observed rotation curves of the galaxy. Therefore, you have to invoke this extra substance, dark matter. Now, for elliptical galaxies, you cannot use rotation curves because these are not rotation-dominated systems. These are dispersion-dominated systems. Like, if you look at molecules inside a balloon, they're moving in random motions, but you can use those dynamics to figure out the dynamical mass holding the galaxy together. So just like with rotation support systems like the Milky Way, where you can use rotation curves to infer the dynamical mass, for dispersion support systems, this is what you can do. You can mention R half, which is, a, which is the radius containing half of the stellar light. And within that region, you can estimate the dynamical mass if you measure the line of sight velocity dispersion. You measure the velocities towards an away view, you draw a histogram, and then you get the width. So with that, you can infer the dynamical mass too. And I'm gonna be talking about this a little bit more during the talk. Now, another thing I want you to remember is the following. So galaxies, most galaxies have dark matter. But as you go into the low mass regime, it turns out that galaxies tend to be more and more dark matter dominated. And there are many reasons out there why uh, this should be the case. But the reason I'm emphasizing this is because the two dark matter ga deficient galaxies that people found in the real universe are actually in this regime. So not only is it surprising that they don't have dark matter, but they happen to be in the regime where they should be completely dominated by dark matter. So I want you to keep that in mind. And I will explain why we think that in general this should be the behavior. Why do we expect tiny galaxies to be super dark matter dominated? So there are two reasons. One is theoretical, the other one is observational. So the first one is a theoretical one, which we call abundance matching. So what I'm showing you here is a stellar mass function. Anything function means you're doing a histogram as a function, uh, as a function of a per unit volume. So for example, here I'm showing you, basically I'm showing you how many galaxies you have in a given mis bin of stellar mass per unit volume. So for example, if I'm looking at galaxies that have two times 10 to 11 solar masses, their abundance is 10 to the minus three. It means if you, if you take a 10 to the three megaparsec cube box, so if you take a box that's 10 megaparsec by 10 megaparsec by 10 megaparsec, you take this box and you move it around the universe, on average you will have one galaxy with a mass of two times 10 to the 11. Does that make sense? So this is what the stellar mass function is telling you, the abundance per unit volume as a function of stellar mass. Now, here I'm so this is from observations, but you can do the same with simulations. You can run a cosmological simulation, you can count halos, you can organize them as a function of mass, and you can count how many halos per unit volume you have as a function of mass. So for example, if I were to take halos that have four times 10 to the 12, I would expect that if I take a box of 10 by 10 by 10 megaparsec and I move that box around the universe, on average I should find one halo with four times 10 to the 12 solar masses in that volume. And this is why we call this abundance matching because we're going to match the abundance of galaxies to the abundance of halos. We're gonna match how frequently you find galaxies in the real universe in a given volume to how frequently you find halos in a given volume in a cosmological simulation. So these two I can match. Oh, and you can see that 
Sorry about that. So you can see that as a function of volume, you will find one galaxy with 2 times 10 to the 11 in the same kind of volumes you would find a halo with 4 times 10 to the 12. So you match it too. So abundance matching is saying these kinds of galaxies tend to live in these kinds of halos. Does that make sense? So I can do that for other abundances like 10 to the minus 5. I can match these two and so forth. And you notice that for every value of stellar mass, I can match the galaxy to a halo of a given value, and this is a monotonic relation. It's not a linear relation because you see that the separation is really big in the massive end, then it shrinks around the Milky Way, and then it gets big in the dwarf region. And I think it's really curious that in the type of galaxy we live, the Milky Way, it's the place where you see the most similarity between the halo mass and the stellar mass. People argue that this is because that's a regime where the process of galaxy formation is most efficient. If you were able to turn all the variance you get from the Big Bang into galaxies, the stellar mass function would follow this other curve, right? So you take the halo mass function and you multiply by the fractional variance. But that's not really the case. But the place where it gets closest is somewhere around the Milky Way. For low mass galaxies, stellar feedback actually prevents that from happening. And for massive galaxies, it could be stellar feedback and feedback from active galactic nuclei that could be preventing the transformation of the variance you get from the Big Bang into stars in galaxies. But now going back to low mass galaxies and dark matter deficient galaxies, I was saying that the reason I'm showing you this is because I wanted to tell you that when you go into the low mass regime, that's where galaxies tend to be more dark matter dominated. So with that matching, now I'm just showing you the stellar mass as a function of halo mass. And you see, for example, if you're looking at galaxies that are around 10 to the 9, the ratio of dark matter to stars is around 200. But once you start going into more, uh, less massive, when you start going into tinier and tinier galaxies, that ratio becomes 2,000 or 20,000. So finding galaxies without dark matter is weird. But finding tiny galaxies without dark matter is even weirder because as we go down in stellar mass, we would expect these galaxies to be more dark matter dominated. So this is abundance matching gives us a theoretical explanation. But also you can look directly and you can take a sample of galaxies. This is work by Tolerate from 2011. And what I'm showing you is on the y-axis, and on the x-axis, I'm showing you the total dynamical mass between this, within this R half. Our half is the radius containing half of the stellar light. So you have your fiber, you measure the dynamical mass. And on the y-axis, I have what we call the mass to light ratio. You measure how much mass you have, you measure how much light you have, and you take the ratio. And you notice that when you go into the low mass regime, we ex the observations tell us that ma the mass to light ratio should go up. In general, tiny galaxies should be dark matter dominated. That's what abundance matching tells us, and this is what the observations tell us. But we find that dark matter deficient galaxies don't have dark matter, which is weird. So use a mini review. We use rotation curves to estimate the total dynamical mass in rotation supported systems like spiral galaxies. We can use this formula by measuring the line of sight velocity dispersion and the size of the galaxy. We can infer the dynamical mass in dispersion supported systems like elliptical galaxies. And we can use abundance matching, and also we can check with observations. We know that when you're looking at tiny galaxies, the tinier the galaxy, the more dark matter dominated it should be. Any questions? Can you determine the oxygen So everything I'll talk about today will be in the local universe. Yeah, so, but it would be interesting to see how these things evolve as a function of redshift. Yes. So the question is, how would this change if you change the cosmology? So I think the, so the observations, they, 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 that doesn't change. Yeah. But the cosmology, well, it depends on how the halo mass function would change, right? Yeah. Uh, so I guess it depends on how much you change the cosmology. But given observations from the CMB and galaxy clusters and clustering, is really there isn't a lot of room to do that. But perhaps you could in the, really in the low mass end where 
there are alternatives to cold dark matter where that could be changed. Any other questions? If not, let's talk about galaxies without dark matter. And this is, uh, we're zooming into a group called NGC 1052. This is an intermediate mass group around 10 to the 13 solar masses. It has a few satellites. That galaxy there is an elliptical galaxy with 10 to the 11 solar masses. And it has some satellites, and some of them are ultra diffuse. So we're zooming into a really diffuse satellite right here. This is NGC 1052 DF2. And this is a, a galaxy that people think doesn't have dark matter. It's a dwarf galaxy without dark matter, even though we would expect those galaxies to have tons of dark matter. And this was discovered with, by the second author of this paper, Shani Daniele, when she was a graduate student with Peter Van Dokum at Yale. He used this instrument called Dragonfly. And this galaxy caught her attention because it looked weird. It, ha it seemed to have too many two super bright globular clusters. So what she did is she got time on Keck and on Hubble and used these globular clusters to measure the line of sight velocity dispersion of the system. And remember, if you measure the size and the velocity dispersion, you can infer the dynamical mass. So this is a histogram of line of sight velocities. The, 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 <coughs> the white histogram is the satellites in the group, and the gray histogram is the globular clusters in this galaxy. And you can also just measure how much light you're getting from the galaxy and estimate the stellar mass. And they found that the stellar mass should be around 10 to the 8. This is a tiny galaxy, right? And because of abundance matching, you will say, well, this kind of tiny galaxy should have a really massive halo, which means it should have a high velocity dispersion. And we would expect the, the line of sight velocity dispersion to have 32 kilometers per second. That's the expectation. Any galaxy at this stellar mass should have a halo that gives you such a high line of sight velocity dispersion, right? But this is what they measured. They measured that the line of sight velocity dispersion is around 8 kilometers per second. These globular clusters, we would expect them to move very quickly, and they are moving slowly. Because that potential field is really weak, because there isn't a lot of dark matter. So you can use this formula again. You can estimate the dynamical mass. and We've, they found that the dynamical mass is consistent with the stellar mass. The dynamical mass you measure, you measure by measuring how quickly those globular clusters are moving is compatible with the stellar light that you get from the background of the galaxy, which means that there is no room for dark matter. Right? And the following year, they found another one. In the same group, this is the F4. From now on, I'm just going to call in the F2 and the F4. They live in this group. There is this huge, massive central here, and these are satellites of that group. And people freaked out when, when these galaxies were found. Some people were like, there's got to be something wrong with the measurements. And Shani got a lot of criticism from, especially people in Tenerife. They, they went, they used their telescopes and said, oh, you have to be wrong. So she got like 90 orbits on Hubble and checked that actually the measurement is right. Then there was criticism from people who don't really like Lando CDM. They say, like, well, maybe you, we need to just get rid of CDM. And there have been a lot of papers proving that lambda CDM is wrong and that we need to modify gravity or other exotic things. And then people like me, people who do simulations with lambda CDM, we try to find these things. And there were like six or seven papers that they tried really hard and they couldn't. And this is the first time we're able to reproduce the properties of these galaxies in a cosmological simulation. So is the paradigm in trouble? Can we, we explain this with simulations? So next I'm going to talk about our cosmological simulations. This is Firebox. Firebox FIRE stands for Feedback in Realistic Environments. This is a model that has been very successful at reproducing properties of galaxies. And what they do, or what we do, is we run a low-resolution uh, low simulation. We target a few galaxies, and we re-simulate it at high resolution. So that has been more or less the industry of the fire simulation. Firebox is the first time we actually run the whole box at extremely high resolution. What makes the simulation better than others? One of them is the physics model. So if you look at most simulations, what they do is when they're deciding the, how to convert gas into stars, they have some efficiency. If you have some dense gas, you convert that into stars with some efficiency. And then you look at observations like the chemical law, 
and you calibrate that efficiency. So you cannot do it by hand. Whereas in our simulation, what we say is the following. If you have a clump of gas and it's self-gravitating, it will convert into stars at 100% efficiency in one dynamical time. Now, that could be scary because you will say, if this is so efficient, then the whole galaxy will turn into stars very quickly. But that doesn't happen because when you make stars, there is feedback. So the stars are dumping uh, energy and momentum into the surroundings, inhibiting star formation in the, in the neighborhood. So it's like, imagine you bring me food. We go to dinner, and you bring me food. And I want to eat all the food. But I start, making, uh, I start making a mess. Everybody in the table is so disgusted that they don't eat the food. So this is what's happening with feedback. The moment you have a self-gravitating cloud and you make stars, the star dumps energy and momentum into the surroundings, and those clouds no, are no longer eligible for star formation. We call this process self-regulated, uh, feedback-regulated star formation. So also, Firebox is really cool because it's the best simulation when it comes to dynamic range. So what I'm showing you here is the mass resolution versus the size of the box. When you have a cosmological simulation, you want to optimize two things. You want to make it as big as possible because you want to get as many galaxies and environments as possible. If you want to simulate cities and you only get a box that's the size of Pasadena, that's not going to be representative, right? You want it to be big enough so it includes South Central and Claremont and Long Beach, right? So you want to optimize the box of the, the size of the box. But also you want to have high enough resolution so that you can actually resolve the galaxies. You want to see the neighborhoods and the houses right, in the city. So you want to do two, two, uh, two things at the same time, and that actually makes it very expensive. So we call that discovery space. Being able to maximize both, that discovery space. Firebox, that's where we are. Before I told you about people doing these zoom simulations where you take a single galaxy and you re-simulate it at really high resolution, I'm showing you a few of them. Firebox has comparable resolution compared to those simulations of single galaxies. And also there are some uh, cosmological simulations that maybe have bigger boxes. You probably heard of Illustrious T and Yee, Eagle, simulations like that. They have poor resolution, but when you actually, so, so this is what's happening when you're looking at mass resolution, but actually when you look at spatial resolution, you can do the same exercise. And you see that actually, when you are actually comparing apples to apples, when you're comparing a physical box size to a spatial resolution, Firebox beats everybody. So that would be maybe the, a better way to describe discovery space. You see up there in the shade, you see this Firebox high resolution. That's a high resolution version of Firebox. Right now it's currently at Redshift 2. We don't know if it's going to continue or if because we're considering maybe using new physics for that. But with just the regular Firebox, that's better than any cosmological simulation out there. So it's really nice because you can take a big chunk of the universe and you can look at many environments and then you can look at individual galaxies and you can look at the structures of those galaxies. You can even track like individual giant molecular clouds in these galaxies in a cosmological context. So some results. Because the F2 and the F4 are tiny galaxies, they have uh, 10 to the 8 solar masses. I will focus on, on small galaxies from now on. So what I'm showing you here is, this is stellar mass. I stop around 10 to the 9. This is the mass in dark matter. Observations look at stuff within our half. They look at stuff within the radius containing half of the light. So every quantity I'm going to show you here is within our half. And this is color coded by the fraction of mass in dark matter. If you're kind of cyan or turquoise, that means that you're dark matter deficient. If you're kind of magenta, you're dark matter dominated. And you see each symbol is a galaxy. I can put some lines to help you figure out where you are. And that band is basically a running average. And you see, below this line, you will have dark matter deficient galaxies. And above that line, you will have dark matter dominated galaxies. And you notice that none of the galaxies I'm showing you here are dark matter deficient. And that's because I'm only showing you central galaxies. So this is where the observations would be. So you can think of a galaxy like the Milky Way. It's a central dominant galaxy in the halo. But the Milky Way has satellites. And each satellite has a subhalo. And in some cases, you can have a satellite of a satellite 
in a subset of halo like the LMC and the SMC. So once I include these substructures, this is what we get. The triangles are the satellite, and we see a few of them. We see seven of them that are below this line. In Firebox, there are seven galaxies that have more stars than dark matter. So these are candidates for being numerical analogs of DF2 and DF4. And I call them after the seven Cherokee clans. So I found seven galaxies and I asked my collaborators, hey, what should we name them? And guess what they said? They said, oh, like the Disney characters. And I was like, uh, I'm not, it's funny, but it's too trivial. And also it's kind of like not cool. Like if I were a, a small person and I read that paper, I would be like, ah, uh, they could have been more creative. I also thought about the seven sisters of Greek mythology, but I'm not a woman. And I felt like it wasn't my place to do that. I have indigenous roots. I have a Cherokee friend, and he consulted with the elders. And the elders gave us permissions to name our seven galaxies in honor of their clans. Each clan has a, its own personality, and it turns out that each galaxy has kind of like its own personality too. So let me introduce you to the seven Cherokee galaxies. So this is Wolf. Here I'm showing you the stellar light. If you pointed the Hubble Space Telescope to this galaxy in the simulation, it would look like this. And this satellite here, that's Wolf. Now, but in, the nice thing about Firebox is that you also know where the dark matter is. And this is the dark matter halo of the central galaxy. And you look at the subhalo, and there is nothing. We can look at the next one. This is Wild Potato. And again, nothing. This is Paint. Paint this is the fluffy one. I love this one. And it doesn't have a, an associated subhalo. So my question to you, there's a quiz. What do these three galaxies have in common? They are close to the central galaxy. They seem to be interacting with a massive galaxy. What else? If you're a shy student, this is an opportunity for you to practice. They seem to be like tidally elongated, yes. So interactions might play a role. Anything else? Are they blue? They seem to be reddish, right? They are probably not making stars. They probably don't have any gas left. And also something you should notice is you can notice the structure of the galaxies, the central galaxies, and they seem to be disturbed. So it might be the case that they, there was an interaction there. This is long hair. This is the one that's farthest away from the central. And actually what happened with long hair is it, w it came into the halo. It crashed to the central galaxy. It crashed within maybe six kiloparsec. It left the halo. And now it's on its way back. It's, around, it's at around 400 kpc from the central. So this is in an extremely radial orbit. It crashed through. It left. It became what we call a flashback galaxy. And now it's on its way back. This is the dark matter map of long hair. And the last three are actually in the same family. They live in the same halo, just like the F2 and the F4. They came together. This is bird blue and deer. And this is the dark matter map. Deer is fluffy too. And the thing I like about blue and bird is that they, are, they came together. They were interacting with each other. They were friends. And then they fell into this halo. A little bit like the LMC and the SMC. So, and this is where they lie in this map. So just to give you a mini review, there exist two dark matter diffusion galaxies. They live in the same group, NGC 1052. They are around 10 to the 8 solar masses, and they are satellites. We found seven dark matter diffusion galaxies in Firebox. They tend to be satellites. They have tidal features. They are red. Three of them are very close to their respective massive host. One of them is really far away, and the th three of them are in the same group. Any questions? I can, I, can, I can amplify the question. Yes, so if uh, these galaxies are dark matter efficient today, but have they always been dark matter efficient? And one of the nice things about cosmological simulations is that you can track the history back in time. So if you track these galaxies to the time when they first became satellites, they were dark matter rich and they were gas rich. And they lost like 99% of their mass in this process as they became satellites. All that matter got stripped away. Any other questions? 
Dylan? So the, the question is, with this, with the volume of the simulation, are we able to calculate the rate of, the frequency of how, uh, how many of these galaxies you find per unit volume? So we make a really stark prediction. We predict that if you take every 10 to 11 solar mass galaxy, it should have at least one satellite within 10 to 8 and 10 to 9 solar masses that's self matter efficient. They have found two. So right now the ball, the, the, the ball is under court. I'm asking observers, go and check. Use things like the Rubin Observatory or whatever and actually find more systems. We are making a really concrete prediction. There was another hand about here. Oh, okay. Any other questions? Yeah. So how do we track matter? Like, is there any sort of source in the interaction between galaxies? Or like any other matter? So the question is what happened to the dark matter? So it, it got stripped. The stars were stripped too, but the dark matter was stripped more efficiently. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit. And you had another question? And I, that's another hand around here. OK, so let's continue. Oh. So what happens with other simulations? How come we're the first to do this? So I'll talk about three simulations. I'll talk about New Horizon. And this is this paper by Jackson 2021. This is a group. Uh, it's mostly based in the UK, Oxford, Hertfordshire, and Korea. I'll talk about the Eagle simulation. This is the group from Durham, although this uh, author is from China. And the last one I'll talk about Illustrious TNG, TNG 50, the high resolution uh, version of Illustrious TNG. This is a group by Lars Hanquist, Harvard, and Laura Sales was the lead author of this paper. So let's start with, uh, oh, with this plot. So before I was showing you quantities within R15, R half. Now we'll show you quant entire quantities, how much dark matter you have in total, how much stellar mass you have in total. So I'm showing you here the stellar mass as a function of the ratio of dark matter to stellar mass. On this side, you will have dark matter deficient galaxies like DF2 and DF4. And again, our centrals follow this relation. If you include the satellites, you see that some of the satellites are actually on that side. So we are able to find dark matter deficient galaxies. And they're not just dark matter deficient between our a half, but actually towards the radius of the subhalo. And the paper by Jackson, they claim that they have found them, but actually when you show those values in this plot, none of them make it past this line. So they say they would claim they found dark matter deficient galaxies. What they meant was that these galaxies tend to have less dark matter than the average galaxy, but none of them cross to the other side. This one, which is the most promising one, has a 60% excess of dark matter. So I wouldn't call that a dark matter deficient galaxy. There was another simulation, but oh, something that also happens is in their simulation, they, they measure how, how close they come, does the satellites come to the central. So this quantity here is the minimum distance between the satellite and the central in units of the, of the halo radius of the host. And Jackson finds that all of their galaxies, they never come within 20% of the radius, of the viral radius of the host. So I want you to remember that. They, their galaxies are being affected by interactions, but none of their galaxies actually come really close. Uh, this is the Eagle high resolution simulation. Unfortunately, they looked at galaxies between 10 to the 9 and 10 to the 10. This is an order of magnitude above the F2 and the F4. And then they use a, a higher resolution version that focuses on galaxies between 10 to the 8 and 10 to the 10. So who knows which of those is going to look like the F2 and the F4. So I email the lead author and say, hey, can you give me the data? Because I'd like to include it in my paper. And it turns out that this one is actually a little bit promising. So if we go back to, oh, sorry about that. that the plot I showed you before, this is where that object is. So in the Eagle High Resolution, there is one object that crosses this line, but it's not consistent with the F2 and the F4. Its stellar mass is too high. Its velocity dispersion is too high. There could be other galaxies in the universe that look like the Eagle High Res object, but they weren't able to reproduce the two existing dark matter deficient galaxies. Something I should say that's unlike the Jackson result, this galaxy actually comes quite close to the central. 
And the last one I want to talk about is uh, Illustro CNG. So I told you that it's been really hard to recreate tiny galaxies with such a small line of sight velocity dispersion. So this is, uh, here I'm showing you the line of sight velocity dispersion versus the stellar mass. This is Illustro CNG 50. This is by Laura Sales. The colored symbols are observations and the gray ones are simulations. No, I'm, I'm sorry, the symbols with error bars are observations, everything else is simulations. This is where DF2 and DF4 are, and none of the galaxies in Illustrious TNG50 actually makes it that low. Most of their galaxies at around 10 to the 8 actually align with the regular galaxies. They're not able to recreate galaxies at 10 to the 8 with tiny velocity dispersions. And we do. One of them, Wolf, is velocity dispersion. It depends on the direction you're looking at it, but it's somewhere between 7.5 or 11. So it's compatible within error with DF2 and DF4. And this is a huge accomplishment. So we can also look at this diagram. Here I'm showing you the line of sight velocity dispersion versus size. Why am I showing you this? Because at the beginning of the talk, I told you that if you measure this R50, if you measure the size of the galaxy, and the line of sight velocity dispersion within that region, you can estimate the dynamical mass. Just like you can use rotation curves for uh, rotation dominated systems, for dispersion dominated systems, if you have these two quantities, you can estimate the stellar, the, you can estimate the dynamical mass, and the dynamical mass which follows these lines based on this formula. This is where the observations are, and these are where the seven dark matter deficient galaxies are. Wild Potato does a really good job, and Wolf is the only one that's actually consistent with the errors in these two dimensions. So it's important to report your results in a way that's friendly to theorists, but it's also important to report your results in the same way as observers do. That's really important. So just a quick review of this. Every cosmological simulation before Firebox is struggled to reproduce numerical analogs of DF2 and DF4. Oh, sorry about that. I'm getting better at this. And they were also really, they, they couldn't also get the low velocity dispersions that people observe. And we find that when it comes to this velocity dispersion versus size plane, Wolf is the one that's most similar to DF2 and DF4. Wolf is the only galaxy in a cosmological simulation that's consistent with DF2 and DF4 in terms of mass, being dark matter deficient, line of sight velocity dispersion, size, and surface index. So this is a huge accomplishment. So how are these galaxy, these dark matter deficient galaxies created? So this picture gives us a clue. And when I quiz you, many of you told me, well, there seems to be a sign of interaction. This is very close to a massive galaxy. There are tidal features, things like that. So the first thing we looked is a stellar mass ratio. We can measure the stellar mass of the satellite and the central, and this is what I'm showing you here. Stellar mass of the satellite, the stellar mass of the central, color coded by the ratio of dark matter to total, the fraction of mass in dark matter. And here I'm only showing you satellites because we already know that the seven dark matter deficient galaxies are satellites. I can draw some lines to guide the eye, so major mergers of two equal galaxies would be along this line. I can include the central galaxy in the group NGC 1052, and I include DF2, DF4, and here are seven dark matter deficient galaxies. In this corner, if we focus at centrals with at least 10 to the 11 solar masses, and we look at their satellites between 10 to the 8 and 30 to the 9, we predict that a third of them should have at least one dark matter deficient galaxy. And also you notice that they are kind of going in along a diagonal, so it's most likely that it's actually the stellar mass ratio that matters. If you want to be a dark matter deficient galaxy, you have to be orbiting a, a galaxy with at least 10 to 11 solar masses, and the stellar mass ratio should be around uh, 1,000 to 1. So this is one of the conditions we need to meet. The other condition, and we make this prediction. Another thing to look at is the uh, interaction history. So here I'm showing you Wolf, and the black solid line is the distance between the satellite and the central as a function of time. 
This is a, at info, the first time it became a satellite, and it came in, and by dynamical friction, that orbit has been sinking, and this is where we are today. Each the vertical dotted line is a paracentric passage. The red one indicates the location where the satellite is closest to the center. The gray solid line is the radius of the host dark matter halo, which is evolving. And the dotted line, this line here, is 5% of that. And we can also look at the mass. So when you become a satellite because of tidal stripping, you start losing mass. So the total mass decreases. The dark matter mass decreases. The stellar mass actually increases a little bit at the beginning, and then it falls. So in this regime, it's still converting gas into stars. But very quickly, you lose your stars, and you, stop and you become quenched. But something you notice is around here, you see that you're losing dark matter very quickly. You're losing stars slowly and therefore the stars catch up with the dark matter. Right? So that goes back to your question. So what happens to the dark matter? So when you have a galaxy, you make stars from cold dense gas, which tends to be strongly bound at the bottom of the potential. You make those stars and they are born uh, very gravitationally bound to the system. That's not the case for dark matter. So you have these stars that are orbiting in the center of the potential, and the dark matter particles are going like this. They're weakly bound. So the moment this system becomes a satellite, it's easier to strip away dark matter particles than stars. If the solar system fell into a bigger system, it would be easier to strip away Pluto than Mercury. So that's more or less what's happening here. And you notice here, if you compare the, stel the mass growth with the, the orbit, the action start ha it starts happening when you come within around 5% of the virial radius of the host. So the second condition is you have to come within 5% of the virial radius of the host to become dark matter deficient. So just to summarize, I can summarize with, with one plot. On this side, I'm putting the stellar ratio, the stellar mass ratio of satellites to central. And here I'm showing the minimum distance between the satellite and the central as a function of the radius of the whole star matter halo. And these are the observations, and here is the seven dark matter deficient galaxies. You already see that they are kind of segregated in this region. To become dark matter deficient, you have to have a stellar mass ratio of around 1,000 to 1, and you have to come within 5% of the virial radius of the host. You need to be you need to have an extremely massive neighbor, a thousand times more massive than you, and you have to interact with it in extremely radial orbits. Notice that there isn't any stuff here. This is where you will find major and minor mergers. And what happens is when you have, when the mass ratio is not as discrepant, if you're a satellite, you're usually given the two options. You can be on this end or that end. You're given the option to assimilate with the massive galaxy, so basically you just merge, People call that cannibalism. Or you can just dissolve. The tidal field will destroy you, and we call that tidal disruption. So in general, that's a standard picture for satellites. You're given two options. You assimilate or you're destroyed. But these galaxies actually choose a third path. They choose to confront this giant galaxy, this Goliath, and they do it multiple times. So going back to this figure, these numbers in brackets are the number of pericentric passages these satellites have had. In general, satellites have like two, three passages and then they dissolve. And these, some of them have had like, for example, Bird Blue had 10 and Bird had 14. They are very resilient galaxies. So just a quick review. There exist two dark matter deficient galaxies. There are seven in our simulation. To become dark matter deficient, you need to have a neighboring central that's around a thousand times more massive than you. And you have to come within 5% of the radius of the host. And we predict that about a third of all 10 to 11 solar masses, mass galaxies should have one of these satellites. And these galaxies are very resilient. They have passages between 2 up to 14. And I feel very strongly connected to these galaxies for the following reason. So as I told you before, if you're a satellite, you're given two options. Either you assimilate or you're destroyed. These galaxies chose to confront the massive galaxy, and they are persisting. They are surviving. 
And as an indigenous person, I feel that that's my history. That's the history of my people. We were given two choices. Either you assimilate or you will be destroyed. But I'm still here. And I might be wearing European clothes and have a European name and speak European languages, but I'm still here, even though the price was to shed my dark matter. I don't know what my cuisine or my music was, but I'm still here. And this is true for all minoritized people in astronomy in any field. If you're the only woman in, in the room or the only black person in the room or the only Muslim in the room, you just remember, you might be told that you have to assimilate or you, have to, or you will be destroyed. There is always a third path. So thank you for your generous attention and please, any questions? So the question is, wouldn't you expect a lot of this to live in cluster? I'd say yes. I, I encourage observers to dedicate time to finding them. Absolutely. They, they are out there and they should be found. Because I have an alternate explanation. Mm -hmm. It's because they're not dark matter fishing, but the stellar mass is raw. So yes, yeah, so when you have a very controversial result, you have to check everything. And, and I agree with you, people in different groups need to confirm the observation. So if people find more, I would encourage multiple groups to double check that they're actually observing things right. I'm not an observer, that would be more of a question for Shani. But even if that were the case, we're still predicting that those galaxies should exist. So maybe the F2 and the F4 are not dark matter efficient, but those galaxies should be out there. Any other questions? Cameron. So it seems like in order to strip the dark matter out of some of these satellites, you have to have the stars more tightly bound, more crusty in their distribution and their mm -hmm. conservation than the dark matter is. But uh, different dark matter models, whether it's PDM or fuzzy dark matter or self interacting dark matter, will predict different concentrations for mm -hmm. that. So to reform your question, it looks like in just vanilla lambda CDM, you expect these things to exist and they exist because of stripping. But it could be the case that if you change the nature of dark matter, you have something like fuzzy or self-interacting or warm. Actually, at the initial conditions can give you the, the propensity to, for that process to be more effective and make more. I wrote an NSF grant, I'm waiting for the result where we are taking this, uh, this one, especially this one, this is the most massive halo in the, in the in simulation, and we're re-simulating with self-interacting dark matter. And other things, we're doing other modifications, like uh, there is this uh, genetically modified initial conditions where we would change a little bit the properties of the initial galaxies or orbits, and also the nature of dark matter. So that's something that I'm very interested in looking. And I think that if the fractions change, that could tell us some, put constraints on uh, and, and th it would be an additional way to put constraints on dark matter from a cosmological perspective. Well, once you strip out the dark matter, then the potential is really to wash out over it. How long do these things last if it's in this new energy? So, they were able to survive for 14 passages, some of them. So, 
so for example, if you look at uh, these two, they survived 14 passages and they're still around. Okay. And, uh, and the growth is, uh, the, the decrease is really slow. But something I want to do with these simulations is, a, no, a nice thing you can do with these zooms is you can just keep going. Cosmological simulation starts at Reggie Zero, but the zooms can just continue for a few billion years, so I can definitely address that. So the question is, well, I'm predicting that there should be, these galaxies should be between 10 to the 8 and 10 to the 9, and the DF2 and DF4 are, are in the lower, low mass end, 10 to the 8. Wouldn't it be easier to find the more massive ones? So I think this was kind of like a serendipity discovery. They weren't looking for these things, they just showed up. And I think if people made a systematic effort, especially in clusters, I would say that it would be easier to find the more massive ones. The density profile. So the the stellar profiles look similar to the ones in that mass regime, and the the dark matter profiles they look quite cuspy. But there's so so few particles that I'm not sure if I can trust the result. Because you're in the regime where you're almost out of like you have like one percent of your uh, system is dark matter, and this is a ten to the eight solar mass galaxy. So I can see those profiles, they don't have any, they, they are, look really cuspy, but it's, I, I would need to do one of the zooms with more particles to check. At higher redshifts, I would expect more interactions with fewer massive galaxies. Mm -hmm. So I also would expect a higher redshift to, for other mechanisms to be at play. So for example, I was looking at images of, uh, Firebox at Redshift 3, and something I found was that these galaxies being fed by filaments, and those filaments were fragmenting. And when you make a, a stellar map, I saw systems that were, look like galaxies. Now this is something I haven't studied or published, but I think that the high Redshift universe can give you weird things too. Oh, I'm glad someone asked that question. So how do you find these galaxies? So in cosmological simulations, we have algorithms that look for galaxies, right? Or look for halos, these uh, are automated algorithms. And they go and look, I run that algorithm and it didn't find any of this. So it was like the algorithm wasn't, was telling me something, the images was telling me that these galaxies exist, but they weren't identified by the algorithm. So I kind of panic, so I make an image of every system in the simulation one by one at many scales from many points of view and check the IDs and make sure that I recover all those galaxies that weren't selected by the algorithm. I like to make the analogy, for example, of like selecting graduate students. And we have many graduate students here. The easy and, the easy and cheap way to do it is we'll say, oh, we're just going to look at the GRE scores. We're going to make a cut and select the ones that get the high GRE. You would miss out on tons of really talented students, right? When you run these algorithms and just like hope for the best, it's cheap, but then you lose really interesting galaxies. But if you actually, as a scientist, you actually do things rigorously and you actually pay attention and you select galaxies or graduate students holistically, you will be surprised by what you would find, right? Does that make sense? Any other questions? If not, I'm going to be here on Friday. I'm happy to talk to you one on one. I live in Southern California. We can always chat on Zoom, or you can come visit us at Pomona. It's a great place to be, right? So thank you for your generous attention. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Jorge, for that wonderful talk. Uh, if you would all please join us now outside, at least, or is it inside for a wine and cheese reception? It is inside now. <laughs> Thank you.